I don't think so. Yeah. Can you see me from where it is? Yeah, I can see you. Okay, cool. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So Welcome to again. our guest lecture with uh, Edward Andor. That's uh, the first of our live lectures. Remember, last two weeks we had some uh, uh, recordings of past speakers, and Edward was actually one of our past speakers two years ago, exactly to the day on the 17th of Feb, a few days before the first lockdown. Edward is an alumnus of this university, so like you, he has got the regions uh, smell, he likes regions, and he likes it so much that he comes back as a guest speaker, so we're very privileged to have him. He is an entrepreneur, and he has a lot of experience, and he's going to share his experience. He's going to talk a little bit about what he's been doing in the last few years, in particular his few ventures, and then also his plans. So I think we're very privileged to have him, and he's going to give a lecture, and then he's going to give you the opportunity to do ask questions. Thank you so much. Over to you, Thank you. Morning, guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. So, yeah, I've been here. Done it. Got the T-shirt. Let's get this up. So, just to give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to tell you guys about myself, my background. I've got a bit of a weird story, especially since I left Regents, which you'll come to learn. Um, I'm going to talk about, for me, what is the essence of being an entrepreneur. Um, then my company, what was my company, Tapewood, um, which there's been a big difference between when I was here two years ago, I just got the investment um, to today, but I'm going to talk to you about that, my successes and my failures, um, the rise and sort of fall, as I call it. Uh, talk to you about how to actually get an investment. Most, most people that come to Regents are growing up in business. Most of them are going to be entrepreneurs starting their own business. So seeking investment is something that most of us will have to come across if we're going down that route. Um, and I learned quite a lot doing it, especially where I met my investors, which I'll get to. Uh, talk about marketing. That's, that's, that's a real deep hole um, with lots of sharks in it. So I'm just going to share my sort of tips uh, that I've experienced and, and again, where I've made failures. Business is all about failure. Even when you get to the top, you're still going to make failures. That's the only way you're going to improve. Um, managing a team. I was the youngest person in my team um, by a decade. Um, and again, I'm going to talk about that. My business, obviously, the transition to what I'm doing now, which is so different from business. Uh, but the, I've used my experience in both to maximize what I'm doing now and my future. And then I'll take some questions from the floor if any of you would like to. So who am I? I uh, graduated from Regents 2017, I started in 2012, I'm not going to lecture these points. When I was at Regents, I've always been an entrepreneur. I started my first business when I was 12 or 13. I was uh, drop shipping, kind of what people do now on Amazon, I was a little bit ahead of the curve. I was buying things from um, China, and Japan, and Asia, uh, East Asia, and basically advertising them on eBay and selling them on, and I never had to lay out a penny because it was drop shipping, if you know what that is. I just had to advertise it when someone bought it, I paid the company, they sent it to them. That was going really well for six months until my suppliers didn't tell me that he was refusing to send orders out anymore. And I, being 12, 13 years old, I'd spent all of the money. It was about 10 or 15,000 pounds I bought and other stuff with it. And my dad gladly, very kindly helped bail me out of it. Um, I also did some stuff on YouTube, um, just towards the end of my time at Regents with cars. Um, cars and watches were always a big part of my life, still are very much into my cars and I started to put a camera in my car and started filming it. I got 150,000 views on YouTube. But it's, it's a very, if any of you ever done it, it's a very, very intense uh, thing to film on YouTube because it is, it is non-stop. Social media is non-stop. It is hard, hard work and if you want to see instant results, you won't. It, it's, a two, it's probably the longest way to see results from something. Um, Langdon's of London and Get Me That Watch um, both started when I was at Regents because you guys have probably seen the car park here. There's a lot of nice cars in here. Um, and I was very connected in that industry because my family's always been collecting cars. So I started to buy and sell cars to the students and around and it expanded from that. Uh, and again, we get me that watch. It was just about high-end watches. I, people would come to me, I'd always wear nice watches. People would come to me, oh, it's lovely, where'd you get that? Then I'd talk to them, find out what they want, and then I'd go and find it for them. I used to sell them finance for cars, insurance for cars. But I did all that from my phone. I never had an office. It was just all about networking, which is what I'm going to get to when I talk about what it is to be an entrepreneur. Um, when I left Regents in 2017, I worked as an analyst for Waverly Investments, their property uh, de development and investment company. And it was anything from small property sites to analyzing whole hotel chains and how to maximize the development and also work with them to get bigger funding. And these projects were anything from 
five million to sort of nine hundred million up to a billion, and I would just analyze these projects day in day out. Is bring them in? Is it good? Yes, no. Basically, like Tinder for property. And then I started Tatewood uh, at the beginning of two thousand and eighteen, which was my business. Uh, and now I'm a second year medical student, which is the the weird part of it, and we'll get onto that afterwards. So, what is an entrepreneur? Um, we're gonna, I'm going to let you guys take over on this bit. So, have you heard of Family Feud? Game? It's kind of like that. So, I was reading last night on online what are, the, what are people generally consider the top 10 attributes for an entrepreneur. Um, so, the best list I found was kind of Harvard. Uh, Harvard Business School released a list. So, on the next slide, I've got their 10 top things. And you're probably wondering what the chocolates are. I was hoping there'd be more of you, but whatever. We'll go that side of the room and this side of the room. I'll give you both, uh, there's, there's 10, I'll give you both 10 opportunities each side to see if you can come up with what the attributes are on market on the board and who, whichever side gets the most, will win the box of chocolates. And then there's a bonus prize at the end. So, you guys can be one team. On that side, you guys this side. Mm -hmm. Who wants to go first? <laughs> we'll do it right, come on. Uh, problem solver. Problem solver, let me see if that's on the list. Uh. <laughs> Fred, no. <laughs> Go on. Looking for a market cap. Oh? Looking for the market cap. Market cap? Gap. Yeah, the market gap. Like uh, Yeah, yeah, I'll give you that. Yeah, go on. <laughs> I'll give you that. It's kind of in there. Outside the box thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Organized. Mm. No, sorry. <laughs> I don't like. We'll go, we'll go each side. Go on. You want to pick one? <laughs> you go behind the going process. Yeah. Me. Yeah. Um, Just throw something at them. Motivator. Why? Driven. Motivator. Yeah, right. Decision making. Decision making. Yeah. Looks so like you're going to get the box celebrations. <laughs> Improviser. Improvisation. Yeah, I'll give you that. Communication. <laughs> no, sorry. This blue hat guy. Uh, blue hat guy. Um, <coughs> talkative. That's simple. No. Consistent. Consistency. Consistency. Yeah, I'll give you that. <laughs> Go on. Risk taker. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's not one of them. Um, yeah, yeah, you, you had one? Yeah, yeah, it was the same one. Yeah. Same one, okay. You got there first. Right, give you two more chances each. This side? Leader. Come on. Leader. Leadership? Yeah, go on. Come on. Creative. Huh? A team player. Yep. Hang on. <laughs> nice. Alright, okay, we've got a tiebreaker. Who gets the closest? Adding new ideas? Creative. I think that was already said. Yeah, I said more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right, you guys got it. If you can get it, you win the celebrations. <laughs> anyone, in, anyone in this team? Yeah, creative, but it's not the same thing. Determination. Yeah. Void seeker. I'm looking for the needs of people's Void needs. seeker. Oh, you've got guys with fists here, right? <laughs> If no one said anything yet, just keep throwing things at me. Innovation. Flexible. Adaptive. Yeah, got it. Right. Adaptability. Okay, you guys are in the celebration. Cheers. Enjoy the now if you wish. <laughs> Very good. Save me a Maltesers one if you find it. Oh, there's a bonus one. You guys watched, did, did they see my lecture from last week? Yeah, we watched it here. We watched it in class. Yes. Cool. I said... I said in the uh, in my lecture there was one attribute, and I still didn't find it on this list. If anyone can tell me what that was, there's one attribute of an entrepreneur that I said two years ago. I said it before that, and I still maintain it to this day. It's probably the most important attribute. Curiosity. Long term focus. No, it's not. It's not on there. It's oh. not on there. It's specifically not on this list, and I haven't found it on the list yet. Social skills. No. Determination. No. I said it in the lecture. If no one guesses it, Jacob wins the, uh, the Oreo cream egg. No? Anyone want to have one more go? Tenacity. 
You really want that cream egg, don't you? No. Um, it's humility. Um, Jackie, you really Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We, share. <laughs> we share that. Absolutely. No, humility. Um, so the reason I say humility is, especially if you're starting a business, if it's especially if it's not an interest that you know, when I started my business statement, which I'll talk about in a minute, I, I had the least amount of experience in that industry. Um, my family's in property, but this was, a, this was an online estate agency. I just had the idea because I had bad experiences as a customer. So I had to surround myself with people that knew a hell of a lot more about every part of my business than I did. But the reason I say humility is I had to have the humility to be able to sit around the table with people that were, you know, I, I, I was 24. 23, 24 when I started the business. Uh, I was the youngest on my team by at least 10 years. Everyone was like 35, 36 plus. Anything from 36 to 75, they were the people on my team. I had the ex head of marketing for Weight Watchers, I had my father, who's very experienced, uh, people from banks, a lot of people in my team. I had a very strong team. And I had to have the humility to sit there and listen to them tell me what needed to happen without, you know, being the, you know, the, the big knob and basically saying that, yeah, it's my business, I'm going to do what I want, you're going to listen to me. You have to, be, you have, to have humility. You have to be able to sit there and listen and interpret what people that know a hell of a lot more are telling you. And that's something I've taken forward from me always. So, Tatewood was my business. Um, we were, uh, we launched it in, well, the concept was in 2018, we launched it in 2019. Uh, we were the first uh, true hybrid estate agency in the UK. Um, if you're not interested in estate agencies, it's extremely boring, so I'll try and make you interesting. Um, in the UK, when you're selling a property, you go to a high street estate agency. There are shops on the high street. They're full of people in suits with short trousers and funny coloured socks. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's true. It's true. I, I broke the trend on that. Um, and you, you pay them a percentage and they'll sell your house or rent it for you. And that kind of percentage went from anything from 1.5% to 3%, a bit less, a bit more, but around that kind of thing. Um, and it worked. I mean, I know other places in the world are a lot more than that, but it. it for the UK, it was expensive for us because it's all you ever know. And I thought, no, there has to be a better way of doing this. And I had such bad experiences with people who were deemed by the industry to be the best at what they do. Really, really bad. I was, I was seeing a property. Um, you guys have probably heard of Foxtons. They're probably one of the biggest in London. Um, they are the biggest in London. And I went there and I asked them a pretty straightforward question. How many, I was buying something, how many square feet is this? Or square meters? Well, I don't know. Have you not got a floor plan? Yeah, the office probably. Oh, I can get it for you and send it to you. Okay, you know, that's, that's a question that should have been answered there and then. It's a pretty standard question. And this went on and on and on and on. And I thought there's got to be a better way of doing this. So number one is customer service. We need to have better customer service. Number two, why do we need to have shops on the high street anymore? That, that's completely useless. No, no, one, no one strolls down the high street and thinks, oh, I'll sell my house. I'll pop into the shop. You just Google it. You just know. I thought there's a way to tap into that. So I thought, right, what have we actually got at the moment? Well, there's things like Purple Bricks or Yopa, which were online estate agencies, but they would pay up front. So you pay for the service, you pay for them to sell your property before they've even sold it. It's kind of like getting on a plane, you're paying, for, you're paying for a ticket for an aircraft, but then they're saying, well, it may or may not take off, we don't know yet, but you're going to pay us anyway. It's as insane as that. You don't know the property's going to sell or not. It, it could sit for, for years, it could sell tomorrow, it might never sell. So I thought, right, well, what if we combine the but the thing with the online ones, they were very cheap because of this. They didn't have any of the running costs of a high street agency. They didn't have to fill an office with staff. They didn't have to have offices everywhere. They didn't have to pay for rent and, and, and service charges and rates and all these things. So I thought, right, let's combine both. Let, let's go for the super high quality service on a, on, a, on a fee that is a percentage of what you're going to sell the property for. But just make it really, really cheap, really, really good service and have it online. And that's what I developed. We ended up charging people. 0.49% uh, to sell their houses, and it went really, really well. Um, so we started developing the concept in 2018. We launched in it was the first quarter of 2019. Uh, after six months, it had gone so well, we started to look for investment. Um, and we, looking for investment is, is tough, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, but we finally achieved the investment in January, actually the week before I came. So two years and a week or two before I came here. Um, that's when we achieved the investment. Um, the business was valued at 1.1 million, uh, 1 .1 million pounds uh, after just six months. We, we've done so well um, in the end of 2020. Um, I'll talk about the downfall of it afterwards. Um, 
which is interesting because I learned quite a lot from it. Now, when it comes to building a team, if you're starting your own business, you really, again, bring that humility trait back. You've got to think, you really got to be honest with yourself and think, right, what do I know? What don't I know? And the, the amount of what you don't know should massively exceed what you do know. Otherwise, you're never going to get anywhere. People always, there's, there's always someone who knows more than you. And it's really important to tap into that and, and be honest with yourself about what you can and can't do. My dad said to me when I was a kid, he said, uh, we were looking for tickets for something and we couldn't find it. Um, and he just walked into, I think it was, I think it was the Ritz. He just walked into the Ritz and asked the concierge to help him. And this concierge ran his tickets. We weren't even staying in the hotel. And he said to me, this always stuck with me, it's not about what you know or being able to get something, but it's about knowing something and being able to do it for you or knowing someone or how to get something. Um, again, with building a team, I had to think about what do I need? Right, I need someone from marketing because I don't know anything about that. I need someone about state agency because I don't know anything about that. I can't build a website. Uh, you know, there's a huge list of things I can't do. I don't know how to you know, really build a very strong financial presentation. So I had to surround myself with all these people. And again, I was just honest with myself. But I literally, I sat down at my desk and I thought, right, what can and what I can't do? And there's very little that I could do, apart from just what I think I'm good at doing is bringing people together. And when I sat there in the boardroom for the three years that we had the business, um, I was basically just a mediator, um, mediating between different people, listening to them argue and then just picking what I thought were the best ideas, regurgitating those best ideas, right, okay, guys, this is what you all told me, you want to do this, you want to do this, well, why don't we do this, what does everyone think about that, and I'd listen to them again, argue it out, I was basically like a debate master, and then I would just choose what we do at the end of it, but the people that were making those debates knew a hell of a lot more than I did, I knew at the beginning very, very little about my industry, and that's why I surrounded myself with someone like my father, who's been property, um, my, my family, my whole life, uh, like I said, we had uh, the head of marketing for Weight Watchers, that was very strong for our marketing. We had someone who was very good in paper clips, someone who was good at web design. I had the treasurer, the ex-treasurer for the Nationwide Bank. He was sitting on my board advising for financials, and all these people worked together to help me develop my business. Budgeting. I won't spend too long on this, but it's just important to have a, bit, a budget in place. Um, I mean, it sounds pretty obvious, but again, you've really got to overcompensate, because one thing you don't want to do is be left short. And again, going back to building the team, you should ask the team what they think it reasonably will cost. Because um, you, could, you could write down a budget and say, right, we're going to spend uh, two grand a month on an office, we're going to spend ten grand a month on marketing, uh, we're going to spend this, and, da, 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 da. and it will nine out of ten times you're wrong. So just, just a little tip, oh, well overcompensate, and let everyone else make your budget for you with a lot of contribute. You make it, but let them all make it if you know what I mean. Let them all contribute, let them all tell you what they think it's going to cost, and probably add on 100% or whatever they suggest, and then you might be starting to get to the ball point, because a very dangerous thing um, that, that can happen, it actually happened to us, but we got over it very quickly, is we completely misjudged our marketing. When we, we said we are going to spend £10,000 a month on pay-per-click advertising, it turns out that's absolutely nothing. And we thought at the time, Christ, that's a lot. You know, we, we had 250000 to start the business with. Uh, we thought, right, that, 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 that's, that's quite a lot. That's a hefty chunk of it. Well, you know, after a year, we're going to make you 50% of the budget. Turns out that's absolutely nothing. We should have been spending 30, 40, 50 grand a month in the beginning. Luckily, we grew organically, so we got over that. But it's just be important to be honest with yourself about what you need. And if you don't have it, and there's no shame in going to ask someone for more if you can, or rejigging the business. When we, when we realized that we didn't have the money to do this big advertising campaign, we just thought, well, we're going to have to do it organically. We've got no choice. It was nice and fancy. It was right there. All the ads were set up. All we had to do was put more money into the account and it was automatic, but we couldn't do it. And we had to have the humility again to realize that we couldn't do it. Bureau of Sharks, it's a very touchy subject for me. Marketing agency, all these companies, marketing agencies, PPC agencies, bless you, offices, leasing companies, all sharks. The worst ones um, are marketing agency and pay-per-click advertising. They have a real tendency to come to you and say, okay, well, you're gonna do a budget of, let's say, I don't know, 10,000 a month. Um, and we're going to charge, uh, we're going to charge you four thousand pounds a month on top of that uh, to run your ads. And at the beginning, I thought, oh, okay, cool, seems fair. You know, they've got all their money, fair enough. Um, but for every, and I'd say this very strongly, for every thousand good marketing agencies out there, there's probably one good one. They are real sharks. If any of you are thinking of going into starting your own business, which I'm sure some of you will, really watch it out. A good agency should be telling you, we will take the money when you make a profit. If they're that good, then they'd be happy to take a uh, percentage of the profits um, because there's no guarantee with it. Anyone can set up a Facebook ad. Anyone, I could teach you all how to set up a Facebook ad campaign in probably 15 minutes. Now, you'd all be 
experts at it, but you really wouldn't be. It's a lot more than that. A good, a good advertising agency, well, pay-per-click agency, who will focus on one aspect, maybe two, but really only one, and that might be Facebook ads, Google ads separately, um, the, the Google Display Network. Um, uh, it could be uh, mail advertising, so generate an email list. The agency, anyone that tells you they can do all of that is talking out of the backside. Right? Okay. And they'll charge you a lot of money to do it and they won't get the results. I, I'm quite touchy on that because I got, I got shocked right at the beginning. We were paying an agency like 35, 40% of our budget to run the adverts um, and we didn't get a single response uh, within six months. Um, so luckily from other advertising we did, but not from that. I understand, sorry for the profanities, um, but this is the, like major. You have to understand the product. Um, you know, if, if you're creating, let's say, pens, do my Jordan Belfort thing. If you're, if you're going to be selling pens, don't just understand what a pen can do. You know, sorry, don't understand just what it's made of, understand what it can do. Who's your customer? You need to eat, sleep, repeat your company. Morning, noon, and night, your brain cannot stop. My brain never stops. At night, I would literally be up in the middle of the night thinking, like, how can I move this forward? How can I move this forward? What can I do? What can we try? What, what kind of wacky stuff can we can do? Wacky ideas are good, but you need to understand your product so well. And understanding your product means understanding your audience. What does your audience want? Um, and that will work well with your marketing. A good marketing agency should be down your neck about what is your product. Don't go to someone thinking, I've got a pen, can you sell it for me please? No, they'll, they'll, if a good agency should turn around and say, what type of pen is it? What's it made of? Who's going to use it? Why do people need it? Why should they use yours? Okay, yours is a lot cheaper, but why should why shouldn't they use someone else's? Why shouldn't they use an established brand like, I don't know, Mont Blanc or Bic or Parker? You have to understand, the more you understand your product, the better your marketing is going to be. Leading a team. Um, so I've kind of touched on this again with humility. Um, Lee, I was, like I said, I was the youngest person in my team. Um, and it's just about sitting back and listening to what everyone has to say. Um, and within the company, I think at the high point we had about 20, 25 employees. Um, and everyone had my mobile number, and I encouraged everyone, no matter who it was, whether it was the intern who, who literally just organised my mail, or, or it was my father, or one of the other directors um, with a lot more corporate experience than me, everyone was encouraged to come to the table. When we had a board meeting, everyone sat around that board table and well, stood, because we didn't have a 25 seat, so I'm not sure I would like. But everyone stood around that board meeting, um, and everyone contributed, and everyone basically just had a chat. Um, one thing we did, we did once, my grandfather told me this, he said uh, he, he used to have a very large company, and he said with board meetings, he said the best way to generate ideas in a board meeting is to get everyone in the company in the room, and no one's allowed to sit down. <laughs> and he said, if ever, you, you, you ask them all to tell you what they need to tell you, and everyone's standing up, and he said when people are standing up, they tend to talk a lot quicker and get, you know, skip over the BS, and they get to their point a lot better. Um, Leading a team, you have to understand, you really need to understand your team members. Everyone is going to have a very different personality. Some people are going to be yes people, they're going to say yes to everything. Some people are going to do whatever they want to please you. Some people are going to be very combative. They're probably your best friends. The ones that are very combative and want to play devil's advocate, they're your best friends. You don't want someone to say yes to you constantly. And um, people that said yes to me constantly didn't stay very long and they didn't work well with me. Because I like to be challenged, because I, I know I don't have all the answers, I still don't have all the answers. Um, but being able to sit down and almost be a counsellor for your group and then listen to people's ideas, talk problems through. I, I had a lot of conflict. I, one of the last people I brought onto the team um, was another guy who owned his own estate agency and he had to sell it um, because his mother became very ill in Turkey. He had to move back for a few years. Um, and he had a lot of experience. And the guy I started the business with had been a career estate agent. He never owned his own agency, but he'd been a career estate agency since he was about 15. He was in his late 50s. And they were at loggerheads, and they were my, my number one and number two guy. They, they directed the business with me probably more than I did, and they were at loggerheads. And I had to be there as, as the boss and make sure that they worked well together. Um, but like I said, it's just about understanding all the little nuances and all the little things each of your team members have. People are weird, I'm weird, and all guys are weird. But it's about understanding those weirdnesses and making them work within the team. Seeking investment. This is, this is my favourite one to talk about because of where I found my investors. So we achieved it in, I think, February 2020. And we were looking since uh, October, early October, September, early October 19. Um, 
it was really tough originally because we're going out more. We, we'd only had really since that the beginning of 2019 the financials. So we had a strong financials, but also we were showing a loss because we'd had to put so much money in to develop the business. Um, and I was looking, looking, we tried to do a crowdfunding campaign with Cedars, which we actually started. Have you guys heard of Cedars? Re really cool company, actually. They, they charge me much, but they're, they're quite cool. Um, and we actually started the crowdfunding campaign, um, and we got about 15, 20% of the way through within a couple of weeks. Um, and then when I was, I was still on the side trying to find someone to fund the whole thing, because I could just give less percentage of over that. And I was looking, 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 and then I realised that my presentation was whack. I really need to, to work on this. Um, and I learned how to do good presentations. I, really, I did learn to do good presentations here. Um, but it was another level of the financials, which I really didn't understand. And I, I really suggest you guys go on YouTube. There's some great stuff out there. Or find someone who's worked in you know, high level in a bank and ask them to show you how to do a financial forecast for a presentation. It's not just simple saying year one, year two, year three. It's a lot more complex than that. And if you get it, it looks very simple, but it's very complex. And if you get it right, you really impress, um, uh, really impress investors. Uh, the golden rule of investors, and I'll tell you where I get my investors in a bit, is then they might be interested in your company, but the person they're investing in is you. Um, if they don't like you, then they're not going to invest in you. And I, and I had that. The first few people I, I was with, um, they didn't like me very much. Um, one of them was the owner of a very, very large online casino, uh, and I was quite against gambling, so there was a little bit of friction between that. I didn't get on with them. Um, there was another guy uh, who uh, he was a uh, he was he was completely against cars. He didn't like anything, even a petrol. He thought it was like the devil's liquid. Um, I didn't realise that, and I'm always trying to talk to people about cars because it's my passion. And the minute he found out I, I, I like cars, he uh, the investment kind of went down from there. So I went back, I rejigged the presentation, and I was looking, 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 and I couldn't find anyone. Um, and then I was at the gym one day, literally half naked, sitting in the jacuzzi. Um, and the, this Greek guy came in. Um, and I knew he had a nice car outside, he had like a really rare Porsche. So we started talking about it. Uh, literally then, just in swimming shorts. And um, three days later, he committed to the investment, just from meeting in the jacuzzi. But you've got to talk to everyone. Um, Second up, financials. Have a solid plan. You need to know your plan for the future, and you really need to know um, being, being a ninja with questions. Um, and that goes together with the plan. You, you need to know exactly what your plan is moving forward. Not just, okay, so um, well, this is where we are today, and we expect to do this, um, you know, we're going to do some marketing. The investor's not going to like that. They, they, they need to know exactly what you're going to do with the money that they're giving you. They also want to know that, and this question I had up, quite a lot um, and I probably had 15 20 meetings with different investors um, before I found the right ones and the, 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 the question was you sure this is enough are you sure if I give you this amount of money it's going to be enough to see you through because I don't want you coming back in a year saying we've all got to die a week because you've run out of money um, uh, so I, I knew my business inside out every question that they had asked I had an answer to and it sounds silly but I used to watch Dragon's Den a lot and that's a really great tool. Watch as many episodes as you can because they're the kind of questions that investors will give you. You think you're going to go in there, right, I know my year one, my year two, my year three, I've got my loss, my profit is, I know how many people I've got, I know what regulations I have, I've got, I've got patent. You can have all those. You need to make sure absolutely every single detail of your business you know. You know, you know more than them, but they're going to try and pick out, they want to find what the pitfalls are. So make sure, that, and you can be, like I said, be a ninja with your questions. Don't. You can't hesitate. They're going to ask you one thing about the financials, and then they're going to ask you about why did you choose this colour scheme. You need to be mentally prepared to, to think, okay, yeah, so this is what we're going to be spending in, in, in this month, and this is what we're going to achieve. And yeah, the reason we chose orange was um, because it was a bit like EasyJet. You know, people associate EasyJet with being a bit cheaper, um, but we also went with the logo this way because it looked a bit classier. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say on that bit. Um, and another one, understand who your investor is. Um, think about the type of person that want uh, to work with. Like I said, you, you, you're only going to work well with certain people. But think about who, who is this type of person I want. Do I want someone very active? Do I want someone who's, who's just going to give me the money and, and leave and, and just wants to see a return? Uh, think about who you want to work with. You know, if, if you think your team is ready, think with them, then you don't want someone that's too involved. Sometimes investors won't have any expertise in the industry. Um, and they like to come in and kind of bully them around. Also, it depends how much percentage they've got. And I said you've got to have humility, you've got to be able to listen to what people are saying. 
just watch out because when, when someone's put money into the business, they have a tendency to, to think they're more than they actually know. Meanwhile, you've built up a team of people that you really know that they know what they know. And if you understand what I mean, it's important. So the rise and sort of fall of Tatewood, um, there was the three main reasons for it. Uh, first was COVID. That was a massive impact on us. Uh, COVID was also a big impact on us. Uh, screwed us over big time. And COVID again, a uh, major problem for us. So as I said, I was here two years ago to the day. I got the investment on the, I think it's the 7th or the 10th of February, so like a week or two after I got the investment I came here. Things were so bright. Everything was epic. I think the money landed in our account that afternoon I was here, or the day after. Um, and we, we all went out uh, to celebrate, and we're thinking this is, this is just going to be amazing. And I think, right, we're going to run the, we won't stand in anything until the middle of March, because March time is when property kind of kicks off. March to July, March to the end of June is the prime property time. And we knew that we had to put a lot of money in every single month, so we didn't want to waste it um, in February. You tend to find that in the, in March, kids are back at school already, um, and between that and the summer, the weather's nicer, people are in a better mood, people tend to start moving and buying property then, people don't tend to do it in August because they're away on holiday, uh, September's okay, it's good for rentals, people start a new job, students moving in, October, November, December, right up until Christmas, you're, you're wasting your time because the lawyers are just slow, the, 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 the agents are slow, every, you know, the surveyors are slow, everything is slow, this time of year, best time to sell property. So we thought, right, we're going to wait. Um, then COVID happened. Um, and I remember sitting there thinking, um, they're going to they're gonna put us into lockdown. And we, you know, state agency, although we were online, whenever we conducted business, it was in person. We had to show people the houses, we had to value houses, we had to check on tenants, to deliver things. And, and I knew there was, a, there was a storm coming. Obviously, I don't think any of us judged how bad and how long it was going to be. Um, so, we, we held on, um, and when they put us into lockdown, I think it was the 23rd of March, and we couldn't operate, we, we really had a problem. Um, I still had staff, I still had an office, I still had uh, regu you know, my, my rent, I still had everything I had to pay for. Uh, but I, I was waiting, when do I pull this trigger to, on the advertising, because we were going to be spending about thirty to 50000 a month on marketing. And I thought, well, I, I, I can't. And um, um, that, that burn would have taken us along with the other things. That's probably six to eight months of, of the cash we had to spend at that level. Uh, and I, and I, I was like, no, I can't do it yet. I have to wait. And they put us into lockdown. That made my decision easy. The minute we went into lockdown, I was like, well, I can't pull the trigger on this because we can't go anywhere. No, one, no one's going to be doing much right now. And then the lockdown turned into sort of six months before it, it was let up, four, five, six months. And then we were going into the back end of the year. Um, and I thought, well, now is an awful time to do it because it's the worst time of year to sell property. I'm not going to achieve anything. But meanwhile, I've still, you know, I've had to make redundancies. We had the furlough scheme, which I had to live with it, but I had to let people go. Um, I gave up the office. I did everything I could to to concert, like to, to reduce our burn down to minimum. I mean, we had, you know, once we got rid of everyone, we probably still had 15, 16 people working for me. And um, after the salaries were paid, I reduced the burn to like five grand a month. It was nothing, really nothing. And I kept reducing it and reducing it as best I could. Um, and again, we came to the end of the year, so I couldn't stop pulling the trigger there. And then in January, I really flared up again. Um, and when we came to the summer last year, in 2021, um, I, I had to think, right, now, now I make or break. Um, but the problem was we used so much cash to survive that we, we didn't have enough to implement our original business plan. And we knew that it would work because we tried and tested everything before we got the investment. Um, and when it came to it, I thought, right, we sat down as a team and we thought, okay, the only way to do this is to do it organically. Focus on, we were, all, we were going across the whole, we mainly focused in the South East, but we, the plan was the UK. So we thought, right, we're going to have to focus this really just in kind of North London and Hertfordshire. Um, and we're going to have to do it organically with very rest of the We just use all, everything we've learned. Unfortunately, what we had wasn't enough. Um, so I had to, I had a decision to make. Um, at the end of last year, kind of September, October, I thought, right, we, we tried changing the business model, but again, we didn't have the money to really push it out there. Um, and I thought, right, I can either go out, we chatted as a team, like, we can either go out and try and find more money, uh, or we can, 
for I'm gonna have to make a tough decision to raise the business now. Um, which I didn't want to do because I had you know, people work to me, and I was, you know, people was people earning their money off me, and I felt very guilty, and then I realised it you know, unfortunately it really wasn't my fault. I did everything right. And if I'd gone back, I would have done everything exactly the same. Um, and then I, I, I really, you know, I, I went on my own and I thought, well, you know, that was really hard for me to get an investment with the very limited financial data I had. And even that, the graph was only looking upwards. So my graph when I got investment, although, you know, if, if you call that the break even, the break even line, although the graph was going like that and still had a bit of, uh, you know, we still had lost, but the graph was going up. Now my graph kind of looked like this. Um, and I still had to convince people on this. And unfortunately, I, I, I didn't even bother trying because I knew that I still had, you know, it was going to take me three to six months again to get investment. And I couldn't support the team. And I couldn't support the business myself because I physically couldn't fund personally to do that. I funded it personally for about two months. And then I decided, right, I think, I think time to put the money on. And it was very painful to do it because, um, you know, this was my baby. For three years, I, I, I nurtured it. I think it was three, four years. I nurtured it, I saw it grow, you know, right before lockdown happened, we didn't know about COVID. I went from a business that had very, you know, initially quite a small investment to start with, being worth well, seven figures, I couldn't believe it. Um, and it was painful, but I had to shut it down. Um, and like I said, if I could go back and change things, I wouldn't change a thing. Um, but yeah, that, that was kind of the point company. It's quite a painful thing to talk about because I put so much blood, sweat and tears into it, literally, all through. Um, and it's painful to shut it down, but, you know, <coughs> sorry to say, but shit happens. Um, that was, yeah, so another one was telling, telling the team that I made that decision. That, again, you need humility for that. <laughs> Biggest time you need humility. Um, to sit down and say, look, this is a decision I've, I've taken. And, and convince everyone why. Because everyone's sitting, no, no, we'll find a way, we'll find a way. But you've got to realise, you've got to find in yourself to realise when it is the time to pull the plug on it. Um, told my investors, and again, I have really good investors there behind me, and they said to me, look, we've, we've been screwed as well. We, COVID has really caused us a lot of problems. Our business is in trouble now as well. You've done everything you can. We would not change our mind about investing in you. We invested in you. The business was a cool idea, but we believed in you. COVID isn't your fault. Um, so, you know, life happens. Um, yeah, and then a completely random thing I did is I decided to apply to do medicine. Um, I always wanted to be a doctor since I was a kid. Always, 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 always. Um, but when I so when it was, sort of came to those important years in school, 16, 17, 18 years old, I didn't want to study uh, much longer. Um, ironically, I ended up doing five years of regions anyway. Um, but I thought, what am I going to do now? Um, uh, and this was, I actually started this journey in 2020. Um, so it was this, this kind of thought process started in, uh, in the middle of lockdown or towards the end, towards the summer um, in 2020. And I thought, how can I do this? Um, and I'm not, I, I told Jacob the story earlier, but I'm, I'm not going to repeat it now, but COVID kind of worked well for me. Terrible in terms of business, but great in terms of medicine. Um, so uh, I, I started medical school. I'm in my second year now. Um, but it's an interesting thing to talk about because they, you, you couldn't have, you know, selling property over here and cutting people open over here because I want to do surgery. But there's actually a lot of attributes that I've taken over that even as a second year medical student, which is still relatively low in the food chain, um, have, have helped me massively and already put me a million miles ahead of anyone else in my class. Um, not one is networking. I talk to everyone. Um, and that has helped me massively in the hospitals because I talk to absolutely everyone. My medical school is actually not here, it's in Georgia. Um, it just gave me, if I, if I had to study medicine in the UK, I went through a two year cycle of exams because I'd already got a degree and I'd already done an, an international science exam and I was able to apply in Georgia straight away. And they've got a uh, partnership with the UK Union, so all my studies done here anyway. Um, but when I go out to Georgia to actually see the university, uh, I went to talk to all the professors, as I did with Jacob, and I, next thing I know is I'm actually in surgery. I want to do, to do surgery. Um, before I went, I did a course with the Royal College of Surgeons. I really wanted to, the same as I said, you've got to understand the product, I, I wanted to understand the topic. So I knew, when I knew that I was going to be in Georgia for three weeks, and I was going to be doing oncology and vascular surgery, uh, I read that topic more than you than that. I got through three books like this within the space of about 10 days to make sure I understood my topic. 
and I improved my surgical skills, which you don't really start until five or six, really the fifth or sixth year. Um, understanding my superior, um, again, same as business, understanding the different people around the table. Um, you need to, if you understand your superior, you'll understand how to talk to them best, you'll understand how to, how to work with them best, and make sure that they like you, because unfortunately in medicine, it's a lot of nepotism, even though they won't admit it. Um, don't be a snob, again, have humility. So when I was in Georgia in November, um, you know, I'd gone from being the boss of a company that was died at a million quid to standing there in my scrubs, um, uh, literally running around making tea for the surgeons. And I was so happy to do it because after doing that for two weeks, uh, they invited me into surgery and I was actually able to operate. Because I'd done all these courses previously, I was able to physically operate under the, obviously under the supervision of the surgeon. Um, is a don't be a snob. Uh, that, that I really took over, you know. Just be prepared to get your hands stuck in the same of the work just because you're the boss of the company. Doesn't mean you shouldn't want to make everyone a cup of tea, doesn't mean you shouldn't um, you know, go to the smaller meetings. You know, don't be a snob. Um, and work ethic. I mean that's pretty obvious with everything, you know, the more effort you put in, the more you're gonna get out of it. Um, and again as I said, I, I made sure that my surgical skills were really up to scratch, even as a second year, before I even went to Georgia because my plan had a plan. My plan was to go to the hospital kiss ass as much as I could to get through the door of the theatre because I can't, here you can't do it at the moment, there's no surgical experience or medical experience unless you're in the UK uni and even then you can't go into surgery because of Covid at the moment. Georgia, things are a little bit different and I became friends with all the doctors there. Um, and we, we chat socially now, and we go out socially when we're in Georgia and when we're in the hospitals they let me operate with them. The coach? Or? Yeah, the coach, you're from Georgia? Um, whole Georgia, yeah. Oh cool. I'm going there in a few weeks. Absolutely love it. Did you see? Yeah, to this here. Come on, Jamal. So yeah, my future. Oh yeah, this, this is my, my. I haven't got many years left. I've got four more years of medical school, uh, two years of foundation training as a doctor, uh, two more years of core surgical training, and then six years, depending on which speciality I want to go in, which will probably be vascular surgery or cardiothoracic surgery. Um, and then I'll be starting my career all over again as a consultant. Um, but I'm always looking for new ideas, ways to improve the field. So I'm always, even now I'm looking at writing research papers. I saw a really cool case, and I'm going to get all geeky now, but it's quite cool. The first day I was in the oncology department, there was a guy who came in, and he, you, you have different markers in your blood for different types of cancers. And this guy had the marker for testicular cancer. And we did the exam. There was no cancer on his, on his testicles, none, none at all, none. We did every scan, felt it, CT, MRI, everything we could. There was no cancer on his testicles. And what we, we took into the embryology department, the histology department, and we tracked it down. Um, basically, what had happened is when he was an embryo growing inside his mum's tummy, um, some of the cells that then developed, because you all start with one cell, some of the cells, they develop and develop and proliferate. One of the cells that, was, that eventually became his testicles got stuck in his chest and it grew into a testicular cancer in just in just front of his heart. So he literally had testicular cancer in his chest. I don't know, that was the face I had when that was all the doctor's faces were like, what the hell? Um, yeah, and so I'm already writing a research paper, already starting a research paper on that. Um, and again, I can't get away from business. I'm actually starting the first uh, student social society in the UK because they're, they're, apart from one course that the Royal College of Surgeons offer, uh, which is your basic surgical skills, suturing, um, hygiene, things like that. There's nothing for people like myself, especially as a graduate student, an older student, who want to do their surgical skills. Um, there is nothing apart from that one course to improve at an early stage. Uh, and a lot of doctors actually fall over, even when they're qualified, because they can't put a stitch in. And I very confidently walk into a hospital now and, and find even a first year surgical training, and I know my suturing will be better than theirs. Um, but that doesn't exist here. Uh, so I'm actually starting now. It'll take quite a few months because I've got to get a lot of surgeons and charities on board, but uh, I'm going to be heading that up already. Um, I, can't get away, I can't get away from business and we will monetize it eventually somehow. Um, so thanks for listening to me. I'm sure I know it got a bit geeky and a bit boring at one point. Um, if any of you've got any questions... So I'm thank you so to much. That was amazing. It was longer perhaps than we thought. It would be. Oh, that's very good. Excellent. No, no, excellent. Um, so do you have any questions? Uh, well, I think uh, well, thanks for sharing your story and the sad about the Henry Colby thing. But I have a question about the, um, in the startup phase with the board. How did you compensate the board? Uh, the with chairs, or did you? So the, the, uh, the, only, the only two board members that were compensated was my number one, my number two, well, I had a number one, number two guy then, number three guy came later. 
Um, but I didn't. I, uh, I sold people the dream. Um, I can convince people of what I want to start, but I was honest. Um, and the people that I found, um, some of them I knew, some of them I didn't. But they were all you know, career people. Um, they were all, like I said, the majority of them all were in their 50s. Um, and I said to them, look, I can't offer you anything right now. But if you like me and you like the idea, you will be here for the long run. And when I can compensate you, I will. And towards the end, we did. Uh, obviously before it went all downhill. Um, but I, I just got them to believe in the idea. So they, you know, we, we, we call it, when we, uh, was one of the first people who was working with me, um, at the start of the business, I gave them a very small percentage. Um, and I was speaking to someone uh, about how much I should give them uh, before I gave them a salary. And they said, well, what kind of equity are they putting in? I said, what kind of equity? There's only one type, right? He said, no, 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 you, you've got equity equity from your pocket. Or well, you've got sweat equity. You know, what, what's the pain they're taking? Um, and, you know, these people put in sweat equity. They didn't put in cash, they didn't get anything out. But they put in their time and they knew that I was going to be putting in all my time to make it work. And they believed in me, because I didn't take any money from the business until it started generating. So they believed in me, and they stuck, they stuck with me. It's, you won't always get it. I got very lucky to find some really wonderful people who were happy to sit there and help me. I mean, the, the, most of the board, especially the non-execs, they weren't there day in, day out. Now, I, had, I had their number, I'd speak to them two, three times a week, but we met up once a month, twice a month sometimes. And they were just happy to do it, happy to help. Any other question? Yes. Uh, how do you manage your extra life, like your personal life, and mm. all the activities uh, that you do? Uh, um, well, before I had a child, it was a lot easier. <laughs> um, uh, well, like I said, I, I, I agreed with business. Everything I did revolved around the business. Um, but I enjoyed what I did. And the same with medicine. You know, someone said to me, uh, it's a very famous quote, I can't remember who it was, but uh, if you enjoy what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. So for me, especially with medicine now, I'm again I'm quite a geek, but you know, when I chill, I read my surgical textbook. I, I made it part of my life. Um, with my wife as well, she was very supportive. And I got married when I was, I was, I got married when I was still at Regions. I was 21 when I got married. And I'm still married. Um, but uh, she was very supportive of me. I had a very good support network around me. Um, and I, can't, I, I think I set like one hour a day in the evening to just do what I wanted to do. Which is normally a bugger all. You should sit in front of the TV and do absolutely nothing. But like, even my other hobbies, like my, my guitar, I had my guitar in the office. And when I was just, when I felt the groove, I just went to the boardroom and just jammed out for an hour. Luckily, my number two guy was a bass player. So he had his bass and his amp in the boardroom as well, so we, we used to do it like that. Um, you, I, I lived the business, so it, it didn't, I didn't have to separate my time. Mm. Everything became, the business became my whole world. Anyone else? Can you just say a few words about valuation? You said the business was valued at one and a half of one million two years ago. Yep. How did you arrive at that number? Uh, <laughs> uh, no, literally it. based. So when we we sat down with the accountants, we looked at all the financials. Yeah. Um, and they said to me, uh, "Did you already have cash flows when you valued it? Did you already have positive cash flows, or was that on the on future earnings?" Mm, I love the future earnings. Yeah. Uh, we did have cash coming in, a lot of it, and like I said, the graph was going right up. We, we, yeah. were, we were very, we were still in a loss, but I think it, I think we put a couple of hundred grand at the beginning, and I think at the point we were seeking investment, mm -hmm. I think it was like eight or nine grand down. So it, 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 we, we virtually made virtually break even. So you, we, within a few months of after approaching the investor, we would have been positive. And the investor who put money in, in two hundred fifty thousand. No, the new investors put in one hundred fifty. Ah, 50,000. And you gave him how much? 16. 16 percent. 16. There's two of them. So. Yeah. And I was prepared to give, I was prepared to give 25 away. And I told him I was prepared to give 10. So definitely better than a dragon. Oh, this is recorded, right? isn't it? Yeah. Well, <laughs> hopefully they won't see it. Uh, but they're, 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 really, they're really good guys. I, I was prepared to give 20, 25. Well, I was prepared to give away what I wanted, what I, yeah. what I needed to. Um, but they, uh, they, they, they came in at 25. I was, I was so happy when they said that. Thought, you just made yeah, my life easier now. Yeah. And then we just chatted for 20 minutes and we agreed at 16. Interesting. Any other questions? If there are no other questions, then a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stop recording. Stop recording.